I mean, Great British Bake Off is legit. Whoa, sudden, like, follower or viewer peak. Not used to this when I stream late at night. But, you know, hey. Um, yeah, this is very spontaneous. Because literally I'm doing this to wind down before bed, I'm a little, like, not all together. I'm very sleepy. So this might take a while. Well, longer than normal, just because I'm like, oh, yes, sleep. Um, okay, so what we got on the docket is Poissier de Lune, which is a dusty purple from Girabon that gets a lot of good press. And I've been wanting to try forever. And I think I got this sample at a local meetup thing. Um, I think so. So where's my... Looking for my little card so I could put this up in the corner. There it is. So yeah, you could see nice, like, dusty purple. Um, and when I say dusty, I don't mean, like, faded. I mean just, like, it's not, like, searing your eyes. But it's more, it's easier on the eyes, but it's still plenty saturated, at least from the swab. I haven't actually used the sample yet, which is part of the reason I'm doing these reviews, is to actually use all my shit. So here we go. We're gonna ink this up. Mm -hmm. Looks like Twitch is being dumb. No. Twitch is being dumb in terms of what it's registering, who's watching, but it's still going. It's still playing. This is why I have like, like I have the, what I'm copying over here. I have the like stream stats down here and I have the output up here and just like all these windows to make sure everything's working correctly. This is what it looked like when I did the podcast too. I had like four carefully overlaid windows just to make sure everything was going as it should. Like in theory, I should just get another monitor but I don't actually, wouldn't actually use it for anything, but like, it seems like not a good reason to get another monitor. I'm still very confused by this. Sorry, I'm just like refreshing things to make sure it counts and shit are right. Oh, I filled that very poorly. Look at my late night, terrible execution of things. Yeah, he finally resigned and I was like, took you long enough, you were a lame duck anyway. I think that's what killed me, it wasn't that he was stubborn refusing to resign because you expect that from all politicians. But when you're a lame duck anyway, like you literally got defeated two months ago in an election in your primary. You got primary two months ago, yet you're refusing to resign. And the se and the legislative session it's over is over. It's not like there's important votes coming up. That's what killed me more than anything. Was like, there is no point to this. Like, why are you fighting? Okay, so where's our stuffs? And I think that's probably why it made national news more than anything. Like one, it was outrageous, but because he was just like, really, really dude, you're gonna be this fucking stubborn about it? I don't. Like, this is ridiculous. Okay. Poissier de Lune. Uh, 
I actually, I've heard the term Streisand effect before, but I actually don't know what it means. I'm assuming it comes from Barbara Streisand. But their Streisand sounds like it could be a fairly common-ish last name, like a politician or something. Okie dokie. So now, in today's story, we're returning to the cesspool of corruption that is Atlanta City Hall. What was this, the theme a couple live streams ago? So yeah. Basically, the previous mayor, it was like, as like shortly after he came out of office, all this stuff came out about just like, oh, it's it's bad. Like the main story in the newspaper was that the Secretary of State, the Georgia Secretary of State, um won the GOP primary on Tuesday for governor. Which, I mean, is very big news, but, like, I was just so done with that race. God. That, this, our governor's race is gonna be bad shit. And when I say our governor's race is going to be batshit, I mean, like, it's going to be nasty. Because both sides were hoping for the outcome that's happening. It's basically the two candidates are polar opposites of each other and, like, rile up the respective bases. So it's just... Ugh. Like, I'm really happy that I don't tend to watch TV. Like... Like, I'll watch um, Netflix and stuff, but I won't watch live TV very often. And when I do listen to the radio live, it's NPR usually. So I won't get bombarded with political ads. But if the Georgia 6th district race, like what last year is any indication... Man, that got annoying after watching the radio, after watching like one SNL. And God, this is a governor's race. And part of the um, Stacey Abrams' strategy is a get out the vote. Man, I'm just... Like, the, it's, oh, and then, um, the, a lot of, like, national political reporters, because, um, our governor's race is very much about, like, kind of party identity and party issues rather than local issues, people are already, like, reporters are already zooming in on this as, like, a what is it like token or like representative bellwether something race so there's gonna be a whole fuck ton of national attention also because if stacy abrams wins she'll be the first black woman governor in the country meanwhile brian kemp when he has been secretary of state was oversaw um, voting machines both getting stolen and hacked into, but insisted there was nothing wrong. His Secretary of State's office is also the reason it took me three times to register, like, attempts to register to vote. Yeah, that one, microcosm. 
So yeah, we're going to have a descent of national reporters that are going to be missing the point largely. Like when Stacey Abrams won on the like general primary day, not the runoff day, which was two days ago, um, everyone, all the reports were like, oh yeah, progressive outsider Stacey Abrams won. And I'm like, Stacey Abrams has been the face of the Democratic Party in Georgia for at least the last five years. Like she is a well-known entity in Georgia. She's like super establishment Democratic Party for like state, at least statewide in the state of Georgia. She's not an outsider. She's progressive, but she's not an outsider. But they're like, oh, because she's progressive and black, she must be an outsider. God, like that's what bothers me the most. It's like simple fact checking. So yeah, this ink was kind of dry in the dry ink. I don't know if there are purges of voter rolls in Georgia. That I haven't heard. I've heard it's happened in other states. Um, they've been a little, it's been a little more subtle, any sort of manipulation here. Um, the early voting locations that are open are very skewed towards Republican districts. Like for the Georgia six, there was one early voting location in DeKalb County, which is a democratic stronghouse. And there was like a bunch in Cobb County, which is a conservative stronghold. Hmm. Which is why Stacey Abrams is focusing on not necessarily like trying to persuade voters, but just getting voters registered and getting them like to the voting place because there has been a fairly systemic disenfranchisement of people that people that lean democratic. And so like, if you look at the Georgia demographics, we should be a lot more purple than our, um, like, state house actually indicates. But there's a huge block that is either not registered or is registered in the wrong place or, like, it's hard for them to get to polling places and whatnot. So that's why there's a big, she has a big push. And honestly, I will say, I did, like I said, it took me like three different attempts to just register to vote in Georgia. The one that worked, the two ways I tried were official. There was the mailing in my documents and then the trying on the online system. Neither of those worked. The one that did work was through a third party voter registration organization that I later learned is one Stacey Abrams started to get voters registered. So it's thanks to Stacey Abrams that I finally got registered to vote, despite multiple attempts. And it wasn't really anything nefarious. It was that for some reason, my address didn't exist in the county records. Like no one who had lived in my apartment before had ever bothered registering to vote, which is ridiculous because my apartment was were built in the 50s. But I didn't get that call until that third party application made its way to the appropriate offices. Versus in New Jersey, it took me like two seconds. So, and then people are always like, well, you can just go register at the DMV. I'm like, do you know, at this point when I first, I didn't get a car until I already, I lived in Georgia for like two, three years. And do you know how hard it is to get to the DMV if you don't have a car? It's like going to take you like an hour each way via public transit. And you have to do it during business hours. 
It's really not feasible. So it disenfranchises poor people because poor people are going to rely on public transportation more and therefore it's or don't have a car and so they're not going to be at the DMV just register to vote when they get their license because they don't need one because they don't have a car and then it's going to be like impossible for them to get there and the mail-in system clearly is shit and poor people tend to vote more democratic So yeah. Oh no, and then, see, I like that, but like New Jersey was really easy to register, like super easy. And then it was super easy to, you didn't automatically get a mail-in ballot, but it was super easy to register to vote by mail. I did it every single time because that was when I was in college. It was just always really easy and always went off without a hitch. Versus here, and I think you could do like same day registration or provisional ballots. Versus here, you have to be registered to vote like two months before the election. Or you can't vote. There's no provisional va- ballots. And there's no like vote by mail. You have to basically register as absentee ballot. We do have early voting. But like I said, those locations are skewed um, away from democratic strongholds and, you know, poor places. It's bad. Like, I shouldn't have to fight to vote. That's a constitutional right I have. That's my problem with it. Like, honestly, like, I kind of care for your, who you vote for, but I more care that you vote. And when you, the state makes it hard for you to vote, that's when I have a problem with it. Especially since the Secretary of State in Georgia is an elected position. Like, it's not an elected position in New Jersey. It's like, oh, so you're going to make it hard to, you're basically tweaking your, the, your own voting system to get yourself reelected. Like that. I do like George's voting stickers. I actually have one right here because I have a bunch of them, so I just accumulate them. But they're peaches. I I am quite fond of them. Anyway, welcome to Sarah's late night rant about elections infrastructure in Georgia. Like the goal, but like seriously, like the goal of the Secretary of State should be to get, to like reduce as many barriers to voting as possible. And to like get as many people registered and to vote as possible because that's like That's literally their job description. I forgot the accent on the last one. I do know French, so that's, I'm always particular about the accents or even like in languages I don't speak, I always try to include the accents because they do mean something. Hmm. 
I mean, I stick mine to my laptop. I did try and stick mine to my water bottle once, but I'm done sticking things in my water, into my water bottle because they always just like peel off from condensation because Georgia humidity. Yeah, sometimes the dry inks in this pen write better on the Kikuyo, but it's still dry. This is a dry ink. It's not like super dry like some of the others because it does flow well on that medium one, but like, yeah, I would avoid this in dry pens. That's fun. Former mayor paid out lump sum um, payments to his cabinet of advisors. Um, that totals over, that totals about $250,000 over the last two years in office. Nice. How do I get on this uh, board of advisor? Exactly, like, clearly I have no problem soapboxing political stuff, so if you wanted, I have lots of ideas about local infrastructure and economy and stuff like that. You wanted, you wanted some advice, Mr. Reed? I could, I could have given you advice, especially for that amount of money. I think this is the same cabinet that the new mayor basically asked, basically fired. Oh no, but that was the city council, not the cabinet. Federal agents are involved in this. Didn't know that. That's fun. Oh, the investigation has been over the last 18 months. Oh, so I do remember hearing about, like, accusations of corruption before Reed left office. But I thought, but at the time, the, like, degree, the severity of the investigation was kind of under wraps unless you're in the know. 
and a lot of this is just now coming to light for the public. Because, like, this has been an ongoing news story combo with the local paper and the local, like, Channel 2 News. But, like, I think it's like, oh, they learned that this was happening and now we're doing a series on it. But took a bit for it to leak that this investigation was happening. Or for the appropriate public documents to be filed and the news places to go like, wait, what? so far no that's a lie there has been there was one but it was like some small fish and it was like a while ago and it, that's the one that like up until that indictment everyone was kind of like this seems kind of bullshit like kind of political but then when the indictment happened everyone was like Oh, wait, never mind. This is actually legit. <laughs> so there might be more indictments to come. But like I said, the new mayor basically fired the entire city council as part of this investigation because it was shown that they had all taken substantial bribes. She was like, you guys need to leave now? <laughs> This is fun. I quote a local defense attorney professor person. Apparently, it's not a fishing expedition. And it's not like your typical corruption. It's more like low-key abusive practices and disregard of policy. So it's not like full-blown like we're paying the mob. It's more low-key shit. That, like, smells bad. But can definitely, like... I can see how these policies that just sort of, like, creep up on, a, like, administrations over the years. Like, each administration pushes the envelope a little farther until all of a sudden you're, like, doing this outrageous shit. Oh, yeah, they're, like, fine-tooth combing this. They're looking at people's, like, sick leave and vacations. So, if it's illegal payouts, it was well-disguised illegal payouts. Which you gotta give them credit for, for good corruption versus the current um, people in the White House, which are just, like, let's be really corrupt and just, like... Be really bad at it at the same time. It's just like facepalm. Like even if you did a shitty thing. For some shitty things I can 
I can comment on, like, financial crimes and shit. I can be like, that was executed really well. Yeah, Reed, the old mare also got on a lot of people's nerves. So I'm not totally surprised that, like, federal investigators and stuff decided, you know, let's fine tooth comb this guy. Because I'm sure this shit has been going on for a while, but, like, he's the one that, like, people were like, you know what? Fuck it. You have pushed my butt. You have pushed one button too far, and I have the power to start all this. You know, this this is nothing like Chicago corruption, like, back in the day. <laughs> like, Chicago corruption's whack. <laughs> but typical big city, like, corruption politics. It's a bit of a nuthouse. On the ink, um, this is by far my favorite in the wet nib, probably because it is a little bit drier. Because um, some inks, when they're really wet, are actually unpleasant to use in fire hoses, just because it's like, I am just painting on the page, no matter how fine the nib is. I don't particularly enjoy that experience, experience for writing. Um, but this strikes a good balance where it's nice and wet, but like not too wet in a wet nib. Um, it's perfectly fine in the regular nib, but yeah, just avoid it in the dry nib. But yeah, that's a lovely, like, dark purple. Like I was saying, I think before you got on, Rowell, that the it's a dusty purple, but more in the sense of, like, it's not eye-searing. It's still very saturated and dark. It's not, like, gray purple. It's just not going to burn your eyes out when you read it. So it's much more appropriate, like... It's not masquerading as black. It's fairly clearly purple, but this is a professional purple, I would say. Like, this would be like, oh, I'm the fun one in my corporate office without being unprofessional. But yeah, that was, that's pretty much it. I think um, this was what I needed to just sort of chill out. Yeah, it does. It's really nice. What are, what are my things that I have on either side of it? Um, Diamine Grape, which I also... Do you like that? It was a bit dry for me. Noodler's Purple Heart. I really like that one. And KWZ Brown Pink. Oh, Noodler's Violet. It's also close to. I have a bottle of Noodler's Violet. I like it that much. Noodler's Violet is a little bit more blue than Poisseur de Lune. Is a little bit more. Poisseur de Lune is a little bit more red. But this is my kind of favorite category of purples. Is the slightly more muted, leans more reddish than like blurples. But not like too red. But anyway, um, it's a little after 2 a.m. here. This is what I wanted to do is just like chill out, write some things, and then roll into bed. So thank you for joining me. Did not expect anyone to join me at this 2 a.m. session. But thank you. And I'll see you guys tomorrow or, you know, whenever I stream again. See you online somewhere probably. Okay, bye.